Shots being fired. It's supposed to be one man there. National Guard man picked down by sniper fire. He was, by his own description, an insignificant dude. One little pawn. A friend told a newspaper years later that he could play a trumpet like music was coming out of the radio. And all John Smith, J.W. as people around here called him, wanted to do is drive his taxi and play his trumpet. He was from Salisbury, North Carolina. He was 40, and he was struggling to eke out a living playing his music, looking for clubs in Newark, New Jersey, where he could play. He loved his collection of 25 jazz records. I was saving money in hopes of getting more and getting his, getting his teeth fixed which would improve his playing. But for money, the music wasn't enough, and he was driving a taxi cab, trying to earn enough money in fares just to pay the sixteen fifty daily fee for use of an independent cab owner's car. When he did things right and got enough fares, he could make $100 a week. That night, he had gotten a late start, I was trying to earn enough money to even cover his day, and he picked up a female passenger. John Smith had served in the Army, Korea, Japan, and the Philippines. He lived in a Hotel Albany on South Street in Newark, playing a few gigs here and there. As he's driving down 15th Street in Newark, he becomes frustrated. There's a police car ahead of them, moving at a very, very slow pace. Now, here's what Time magazine says at the time, that he grew impatient and imprudent by braking, then accelerating, flicking his lights, and essentially tailgating the police car. That's what makes it into the magazine with a, his face on the front cover. But Smith's account is very different. He says he was riding down the street. The police car is there, double parked, not moving. He figures they're working. He signals and then he passes the car. And that sets them off. They opened the taxi door, told Smith he was being arrested, insulted the passenger in order to get out of the cab. On the way to the precinct, the patrolman in the front passenger seat turned around to Smith in the back, punched him several times. The driver, his partner told him to stop. But he didn't tell him to stop because he wanted him to not be injured. He told him to stop because, no, this baby is mine. There was no resistance on my part, Smith says, when he's finally to get a bail hearing. It was a cover story by the police. He was dragged inside the station. Two arresting officers, seven or eight other cops, kicked him, beat him, first behind a closed door, and then later in a holding cell. While my head was over a toilet bowl in the cell, I was struck on the back of the head with a revolver. I was being cursed while they were beating me. But in bringing Smith into the station house after being beaten in the car, plenty of witnesses were watching that. They saw how uh, each of the two arresting officers grabbed one of each of Smith's arms. So they took him out of the cab, put him in the car. One of the policemen beat him up took him to the station, and when they did that, they made a mistake because they had to drag him in front of all those people who had Hayes Holmes out on a hot July night. Right across from the police station was the Hayes Homes. This was a, a relatively new, decade old or so, high-rise that had been constructed. There were 1,450 units in it. They saw it. They called local civil rights organizations, tenants, activists that had recently, because of other incidents, formed rumors spread throughout the city that the cab driver was killed. By 10 p.m., three dozen gathered outside the precinct. Probably 
because this was the last straw. I mean, the people had suffered so much under the police, under unscrupulous landlords. Apparently they summoned Esther Williams, who was a tenant leader from the Hayes Homes, and whose husband had been brutalized at the same station years before. And as a crowd of 75 strong approached the station house, police allowed entry to about a dozen people, including Esther and Robert Curvin of the Congress of Racial Equality. They observed Smith lying in his cell, and he was alive, but he was in severe pain. And they asked the precinct leader, why hasn't the prisoner been allowed to see a doctor? He was eventually taken out through the rear door, loaded into a patrol car, and sent to the hospital. It was discovered he had a broken rib and other less serious injuries. People followed the car to the hospital. Because, in the words of Curvin, the leader of CORE there, frankly, no one trusted the police enough to take someone to the hospital, even in a situation like that. A dozen policemen tried to disperse the crowd that was outside the Prinkstink. Thirty taxi cabs, in a sign of solidarity with Smith, blocked the street. And the protest grew until it was at least 250 people. People from the homes and established activists such as those of the United Community Corporation, federally funded anti-poverty organization, urged people to go home peacefully and have a formal protest the following morning at City Hall. As they did this, a Molotov cocktail slammed into the 4th Precinct. Police rushed out of the station house wearing riot helmets, welding nightsticks, surrounded the building. There were scattered disruptions. There were... Dozens of people that arrived even at 2 a.m. to join, and then eventually police would secure the area and then have further problems. Those who had been dispersed from the area around the precinct began looting, striking Harry's liquor store a block away from the precinct, and then smashing them to the windows at Jack's Tavern. But by 4 a.m., it was relatively quiet on the streets of Newark. Riding had been ugly. But the destruction wasn't too severe. Damage to businesses was estimated from that night, just about 2,500. 25 people were arrested, and the incident might have just passed. The situation is normal, the police chief said. And he told the 4th Precinct, put the windows in early in the morning, get the place cleaned up, just return to normal, and don't treat it as a situation. Because once you begin to look at problems as problems, they become problems. That's kind of the account roughly in a book that I like a lot called How Newark Became Newark, A History of Newark, New Jersey, by Brad Tuttle. Rutgers University Press. Um, Newark, New Jersey is kind of an interesting city, particularly for New York and New Jersey history. It's founded in the 1600s, in fact, at the time of 1967, as these events are going to occur, they're having a celebration of 300 years of Newark. It's founded by Puritans who were looking for a space, and a lot of uh, New Jersey was settled by Dutch or other settlers. Not going to be a large city at the time of the Revolution, you know, not as large as it is the time we're talking about, when it had about 400,000 people. It's going to build itself after and become principally a manufacturing city, going to have a role in the Civil War, going to be a kind of a pro-Confederate city, a supporter of Copperhead Democrats during that time. So, uh, I, and there's a lot to it. I, I really do encourage you to read how Newark became Newark. One of the other things that's going to happen in the history of Newark is that the African-American population is going to increase over time. It's a reaction to Jim Crow. And African Americans voting with their feet and moving north, particularly during World War One, and then again during World War Two. The population of Newark is still going to be about sixty-five percent white in nineteen sixty, but that's going to change dramatically in the next three decades. Nineteen ninety, it's about twenty-eight percent. The population drops in 1960 from 405,000 to 275, and some of the reason for that is going to be what happens in the next few days. In an application for a federal grant in 1967, Newark's own town officials noted that of every major city in the country, Newark had the highest percentage of substandard housing, the most crime per 100,000 people, the heaviest per capita tax burden, and the highest rates of disease. New tuberculosis cases and maternal mortality was way out of whack. 
Martin Luther King, still alive at this point, had called Newark one of several powder kegs around the nation, ready to explode. But the mayor, Hugh Adonazino, kind of waves things off. No problem here. Things are under control. He's going to meet with civil rights leaders on Thursday. Everything's cool. He was popular. He went to high school in Newark. He was a quarterback of Newark in 1934, served in World War II, and then came out and ran as a young guy running for Congress in his neighborhood. He was supported by Italian-Americans and always supported by African-Americans in Newark. His 62 and 66 elections, just had one the year before, were landslides. But there was an underside. Rumors of mob support, this was... Almost every mayor of Newark up until that time. Uh, he was part of a pattern of awarding contracts to friends and cronies. Some of them price on anything in City Hall, they said. He's known to have told a friend. There was no money being a congressman. You can make millions as Newark mayor. And later, he's going to be indicted. And the prosecutor would, will accuse him of delivering Newark to organized crime. One of the key areas of uh, discontent was housing and the amount of housing allowed and the quality of that housing for African-American citizens versus Italian-Americans in town. But particularly, Anadazino stirs up a hornet's nest when he cuts a deal with the New Jersey College of Medicine and Dentistry. And to get them to come to Newark, he has to give them a large amount of space. Well, what's in that space now? Many middle-class African-American homes. He's displacing, and they say the city, just 3,000 people, but estimates are it's up to 20,000 people that are displaced. They're angered about this. Police force, police force at this time is about 90% white. Junius Williams, studying law at the time. For weeks, black people had been saying the community was ready to explode. I heard it in bars and at neighborhood meetings. Most people didn't want to riot. And even fewer had a sense of what to do if one broke out. But they knew it was coming. They knew about Birmingham in 63, Harlem in 64, Watson 65. They knew about the death and the destruction. Many wondered, was it worth it? But some were too mad to care. And then in response to the New Jersey College of Medicine and Dentistry proposal that sparked so much outrage, the city of Newark did hold blight hearings. Many of Newark's black residents spoke up. We live in the Central Ward. We know what is best for the Central Ward, and we know what we want for the Central Ward, and we don't want a medical school. You build it, we'll burn it down. So said Aubrey Jones. James Walker said, I say here that if you don't give us housing in this city of Newark prior to your medical college, that your Essex County College, that blood will run down the streets of Newark. Your blood and my blood. And I state this. This is a time when over 4,400 people are on housing lists waiting for a spot. At the same time, people in houses are complaining about the conditions. Joseph Brown, the black people are sick, tired, and angry at the old structure that has enslaved and suppressed them for over 300 years. So if you think if it happens, you can turn the National Guard on them, on us. Gentlemen, when revolt comes and bloodshed will accompany a revolt, it will not be justified. This is all before the riots. And particularly, there's a tumult over the decision to not appoint a black Board of Education president and instead leave the old crony in. So when the mayor meets with African-American politicians and civil rights leaders, they describe this meeting as long and inconclusive. They issue demands. We want to suspend the two officers who arrest John Smith. We want the establishment of a panel to investigate the previous night's disorder. And we want the promotion of a black police officer to the position of captain. Adonazino is aware of the politics, and he asks for a couple days to consider the decision. This angers Robert Curvin, who's the leader of CORE, said the people are fantastically aggrieved. You can look at this as an isolated incident if you want to, but it's not just Smith. And there is going to be leaflets saying stop police brutality passed all over the area near the 4th Precinct. Again, from uh, Tuttle's book, he talks about one incident that really angered the community in Newark and 
Edward Taylor is just merely walking down the street in 1954. He's a heavy set 29 year old man. He sees two policemen across the street confronting a group of African Americans on the sidewalk. He stops to watch what's happening. Police tell him to keep moving. He couldn't hear the officer say that. And he crosses the street. He then testifies. The two arresting officers beat him on the sidewalk, beat him in the station house. Then they planted a five-inch knife on him to justify the arrest. Another incident in 1959. Black man stopped for traffic violations. He then needs 37 stitches and several days in the hospital to recuperate. This sparks a forum of 250 African-American ministers and businessmen who gather to hear quotes from leaders denouncing incidents of public brutality. These weren't isolated incidents. Throughout the 50s and early 60s, there were several incidents in the newspapers that Tuttle has found where they're reported as minor incidents, but an African-American person, you know, stopped for a traffic violation or something else, ends up dead. A rally is planned the next day at the 4th Precinct, and TV cameras are invited. Photo op type picket, not a large group that afternoon, along with a TV cameras. But a larger group, maybe 300, are at the Hayes Towers. These looming buildings. They've since been destroyed in 1998. They were considered unviable. This overlooked the precinct, and people there could see, and they gathered around the buildings to watch, about 300 of them. As the rally began, bottles, rocks, whatever, came down from the towers onto the precinct. The rally had to stop, and when they fled, a woman came out with a metal pole and broke windows at the precinct. Now police ran out with nightsticks, and dozens of reinforcements came from other areas of the city. Garbage cans were thrown into police cars. A police van's glass windows were shattered by a rock, injuring the police officer inside. The vandalism now spreads for 15 blocks. Through the Central Ward, through the main thoroughfare, Springfield Avenue, the windows are smashed, some buildings are set ablaze. But it does quell by midnight, and the mayor says, it's all well in hand. Despite his exterior confidence, Adonzino calls... Governor Richard Hughes, and says, bring in the National Guard and the state police. Governor Hughes is from South Jersey, kind of looks like a Buddy Holly type figure. He's a little peeved that the Newark mayor isn't able to control the city, that he's so insistent, but he makes a few proclamations. Cars are banned in Newark by the state of New Jersey, banned from roads between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Liquor stores, by his order, and bars are closed. So are sporting goods stores, where one might get guns or ammunition. Here's how Tuttle describes it. Looting and vandalism ensued. Young men picked up ash cans, hurled them through plate grass windows, and ran off with radios, TV, and bottles of liquor. There were shifts of people at work, describes Amiri Baraka, the poet, who drove slowly down Springfield in a Volkswagen van that night before being pulled over, beaten, and arrested by a group of police officers that included an Italian high school classmate of his. The window breakers would come first. Wash. Glass all over everywhere. Then the getters would get through and get the getting. Some serious people would park near the corner and load up their trunks, make as many trips as the traffic could bear. Some people would run through the streets with it, with the stuff, and they would carry or roll or drag or pull. Families worked together, carrying sofas and TVs collectively down the street. Everything they saw on television, that they had been hypnotized into wanting, they finally had a chance to cop. The worst race riots since those two years ago in the Watts section of Los Angeles rocked New Jersey's largest city, Newark, for five consecutive days and nights. At least 24 persons are killed. More than 1,800 wounded, some 1,400 arrested. Despite patrolling by city and state police, millions of dollars in property damage is done. The fury of the mob makes any official-looking vehicle a target. Junius Williams. So here I was driving back into Newark late at night. Had no intention of burning or looting or shooting police, but I had to be there. On the second night of the rebellion, 
I was driving around with these three guys in my car. It was past the 10 p.m. curfew, but we needed to see what was going on in the streets. I was climbing up the hill when I heard the siren. It was a hot night. The windows of my white Ford Fairlane 500 were down. We neared the corner, which is now Martin Luther King Boulevard, then High Street, when I picked up the whirling lights of a Newark police car in my rearview mirror. Pulled over to the grassy divider in the middle of the street. The squad car sped forward, angling in front of me, presumably to prevent our escape. Four cops jumped out, guns drawn, and ordered us out of the car with hands up. One of them had a shotgun. We stepped out from the car as directed. And one of them yelled, up against the cars, and a lot of cursing. The street was deserted. We knew we were in big trouble. I never before looked down the wrong end of a shotgun. It seemed like it was looking back at me. I turned and assumed the position, hands on the roof, legs spread wide. Pat Down produced no weapons. We had no weapons, but these guys were scary. One ordered me to open my trunk, which I did without hesitation. I thought about my Virginia plates. It was popularly held in government that when unrest came to Newark, it would be outside agitators. There was anger in these cops and there were no witnesses around. I felt they were looking at me for any sudden move. One of them was poking his gun, vicious stabs, barking out orders. Maybe he'd used these moves before, hoping that the urban deer would make a break so he could shoot them down. But we stayed cool, no eye contact, say nothing. Fortunately, one of them, Sergeant, seemed a little older, noticed a box of law books in my trunk. He's got law books in the back, he told the others. Let him go. He repeated it several times. We were still worried. Was he really in charge? We stayed put, till the most nervous of the cops put his weapon in his holster. Shotgun man lowered his weapon, too. And just as quickly as they had descended on us, they were gone into the night. So said Junius Williams. Looting was prevalent, but it began to be clear that there were patterns. It was more often that a white-owned business, especially if it was someone who had a reputation of taking advantage of locals, their store would be looted. On the other hand, there were businesses that were boarded up and marked with the words Soul Brother, generally left alone. A white man was caught by a reporter spray-painting the wood on his store with the words S-O-U-L. What else can I do, he said. If I don't do it, it'll get trashed. They'll come, if they don't get me today, they'll come through tomorrow. Cops soon saw this and resented it. And they would target any stores that had Soul Brother signs on it. Safe from the rioters, these stores, furniture stores, bars would now be laced with bullets and shotgun pellets. On the night of July 12th, 1967, Moses Spielberg, a merchant in town, finished counting the money in his register, and he called the police director, Spina. Uh, Spina promised Spielberg that everything was under control. He should just go home with his wife and kids. As the president of Springfield and Merchants, I spoke to uh, uh, Spina, who was the uh, director of the police, and he... And he and I told him I was a little concerned about what happened, considering what the other riots all over the country, what was his feelings. And he felt that there wouldn't be any problem that evening. But it didn't work out that way. Shortly after he hangs up the phone, an industrial-sized trash can came flying through his store's front window. Two Newark policemen immediately rushed, demanding that Spielberg leave Newark right away. The rioters were taking over the city, the police said. After one officer promised to stand guard in front of the store, Spielberg escaped the city. I left the area in the back seat of the floor of this automobile driven by my African-American employee, and that's how I got back home. I called my store at 12 o'clock, and Bill, one of my employees, says everything is cool. I called back at 1 o'clock, and nobody answered, so I figured they bombed the store. But they hadn't. Early in the next morning, Moses drove back into the city to find the same policeman still standing. Bill, his employee, people from the community were sitting on the ledge in front of the store, and they didn't get anything from that store. I was very intimidated and frightened, and I, as I've said many times before, I had 
uh, just flown 35 bombing raids over Germany, had been shot down, and this was, a, and this was more frightening. At least when you were flying, you knew what to expect. And this was just <laughs> clear out of what this happened. Spielberg was the president of the Merchants Association in Newark. He'd just been on the job a few months, but he wanted to enlist the help of the media. I got on television. I defended merchants. I said, you know, the problem isn't with us. It's with the city administration. We've been asking the mayor to do something for some time. Has continued to say, see, we don't have any problems in this city. Look at all the riots in other cities. Newark is fine. I kept saying we made mistakes. Let's see if we can figure it out. But I pleaded with the media. Spielberg said, don't show the pictures. Don't show the riot pictures. That's what inflamed the public more. You can report the damn thing. Report it. Half the people don't read it anyway. But when you show it on television, some of the militants who were looking for a shtick say, hey, that's great. Looters arrested by National Guardsmen are dealt with swiftly. A 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew is clamped on fully one-third of Newark. While Newark struggles to restore peace and order, the racial bitterness spreads to four nearby suburban towns where a policeman is beaten to death. Guns are stolen, looting and violence are reported. Police officer Edward Williams, who worked in community relations. Smoke poured out of a toy store set on fire. The shelves and racks of dresses, stores and laundromats were emptied. I saw people whom I had known for years to be law-abiding citizens caught up in the fever of lawlessness. Openly, I saw a mother carrying a lamp she had taken from a store window and her young son following behind with the matching shade. It doesn't make sense, says uh, Joseph Davis, who's interviewed in the newspaper, 41-year-old. Discrimination isn't at the bottom of this. It's just violence. Rumors abounded that there were more people coming, that there were uh, the FBI in Buffalo tells the Newark government, the state police, that there are dozens of people coming from Detroit to help with the revolution. The weekend is surreal. There are tanks on the street and there are police cars blazoned in barbed wire. Other cars are on the streets on fire and fires dot the city. National Guard and state police push bayonets. The deputy chief says on the radio, firearms may be used when your or another partner's life is in danger. Police are encouraged, so are state police and National Guard, to bring their own firearms, bring their own guns. And shotguns, about 30 shotguns the city has procured, that that was their riot protection, based on worries of riots that occurred in Los Angeles two years earlier and that were threatened. On the night of July 12th, Clement and Bonnie Moorman were driving home. They were musicians and they were doing a gig at the Governor Morris Hotel in Morristown. As they approached their house, Mormon was surprised to see the entrance to Newark barricaded. As we came home, we had to come home through a neighboring town. The National Guard was there on the streets, and they had their machine guns and everything. You had to show identification, and you had to reach very carefully, because they were trained to shoot. As a child in the 1920s, Mormon had been fortunate to live in a well-furnished, properly heated home. Now, looking at the projects in Newark surrounding his home on Custer Avenue, he realized that nice apartments were no longer available. When these buildings first went up, we were all so proud. They were beautiful, beautiful buildings. But within a just few years, there were nothing more than containers of violence and disease. Kids would urinate on the walls. People would get raped there. The elevators were just terrible and ruined from people moving in. His sister Thelma lived in those housing units and struggled to stay alive when bullets pierced the foundation of her building. Mormon felt helpless as a lifelong resident of the city. She would hear bullets flying, and she would get back from the window. That's all you could do. J. Barry Washington I was 19 years old that summer and, for the most part, watched the chaos unfold from a bedroom window in the Hayes homes. One night he was walking home from work. The guardsman stopped him on the street and bludgeoned him in the ribs with the butt of his firearm. Bruised but not beaten, he stumbled home a new man. I saw in that moment as my awakening. I learned then that my skin meant I was always subject to violence. And that's something I'll never forget.
this from a, a witness in a fi- Newark firehouse, one of the firemen, recording in his journal. On Friday evening, the tone of the riots began to change, where the night before, there was no gunfire to speak of. At 5 o'clock, shots began to ring out around 6 Engine on Springfield Avenue. Battalion Chief Ed Wall was leaving the quarters on Battalion Four shared with that company. At that time, the street was Belgian blocks. I saw sparks coming off the blocks. We took off. My driver said, what? I said, there's somebody shooting at us. After a sniper began firing from an eighth floor window of projects across from the firehouse, six engine and battalion four went out of service. The National Guard troops were young and very scared. To Newark firefighters, most of whom were veterans, they presented another danger to be dealt with. One captain found it necessary to disarm a guardsman because whenever he heard a shot, the young men would charge into the firehouse with the rifle bayonet fixed, unsheathed and at his waist in a horizontal position. After being warned to stop at her, he would injure or kill one of the firefighters who would be running out at all times. The captain felt obliged to relieve the guardsman of his weapon. By the fifth day, nearly half of Newark's 23.7 square miles was an occupied zone. From the moment the Newark police received backup, in the form of hundreds and hundreds of state police and National Guard, word spread that snipers were targeting law enforcement officers and firemen. From July 14th to 17th, there were no fewer than 79 reports of sniper activity. Every time you think things are under control, sniping breaks out, said the mayor, after meeting with newer clergymen. It's like Vietnam. 7.30 on Friday night, police chief detective Fred Toto was shot and killed, reportedly by a sniper holed up in the Stella Wright housing project. Around the same time, firefighters who over a five-day stretch received 364 calls, when ordinarily a dozen calls constituted a busy day, were on Prince Street, battling blazes in a string of three-story brick structures that had been looted the night before. The firemen said snipers were shooting at them from 14 stories up the nearby Scudder Homes project, prompting police to evacuate the building before blasting away hundreds of rounds with revolvers and machine guns. Dozens of families who have fled apartments watched from the street as bullets clipped away at bricks and shattered nearly every window on the top six floors. No snipers were found. Police said they must have escaped through the building's cellar. Uh, Things were um, uh, such in those early hours uh, of the riot that uh, Governor Hughes brought in the National Guard and the state police to quell the violence of the first riot. When, when, when those um, troops and troopers were brought in, then we enter the so-called second riot, which had all the markings of a, a riot by law enforcement officers. As news spread that night of the detective's death and the shootings of two other policemen who would survive, Governor Hughes says this, the line between the jungle and the law might as well be drawn here as in any place in America. In the few hours between the time Detective Toto was slain and midnight, four African Americans were shot and killed, including 10-year-old Eddie Moss, who was riding in a car when a bullet hit him behind the right ear. At midnight on Friday, the body count stood at 14, all but one from bullet wounds. About a 100 civilians suffered gunshot wounds before daybreak on Saturday. Starting at 10 o'clock at night, A curfew on the movement of cars through the town was relentlessly enforced. Guardsmen halted scores of cars, made the occupants get out and proceed on foot. This didn't matter where they came from, whether it was in Newark or not. Pull your car over to the side, park it, and lock it, was the order transmitted over the bullhorns. You must be off the streets. So it's 10 o'clock for cars, and they had an hour to get home by foot. Several families, both black and white, were overtaken by the curfew, this is according to a report in the New York Times, when they were only a block or two away from the city line. When they protested, they lived in the suburbs, and it was silly to abandon their cars in an area of violence. The officers shrugged, following the governor's orders. By 1.30, most of the main streets were deserted by pedestrians. The soldiers crouched at the bases of buildings and behind trees, scanning as searchlights played over them. John Smith, the cab driver, 
who in effect started the thing, is released from the hospital. But he's still not free of trouble. He suffered broken ribs, busted jaw. He goes back to the Hotel Albany. He says, I can look out the windows and see them running down the street shooting. One time I was looking out the window when a gun was pointed right at me. That was frightening. I didn't stand by the window anymore. On Saturday, the director of police, Dominic Spina, received a report of snipers in a housing project. When he arrives, he sees approximately 100 National Guardsmen and police officers crouching behind vehicles, hiding in corners and lying on the ground at every edge of the courtyard. Since everything appeared quiet, it was broad daylight. He walks down the middle of the street. Nothing happens. As he comes to the last building of the complex, he hears a shot. All around him, troopers jump, believing themselves to be under fire. A moment later, a young guardsman ran from behind a building. Spina goes over to him. Did you fire the shot? Yes, the soldier says. I had to fire to scare a man away from the window. That was his orders from the governor to keep everybody from the windows. Spina tells the, sh the soldier, do you know what you just did? You have now created a state of hysteria. Every guardsman up and down the street and every state policeman, city policeman, thinks that somebody just fired a shot. A short time later, more gunshots were heard. Investigating, Spina came upon a man sitting on a wall. He said, that's no firing. That's fireworks. If you look up to the fourth floor, you will see people are throwing down cherry bombs. Despite Spina's intervention, by 6 o'clock that evening, two columns of National Guardsmen and state troopers were directing mass fire into the housing project in response to what they believed were snipers. There were indeed snipers. I mean, this is, if not documented by admission, there's a Life magazine interview where a, the reporter talks to some. Uh, there were certainly people with rifles, with ammunition. There's thousands of arrests, and most of them remain in jail because the massive job of arraigning them and setting bail couldn't be completed. Even when bail was set, paperwork wasn't finished, this according to the New York Times, and in the confusion... It was impossible to determine even where a prisoner was being held. Governor Hughes arrives in Newark and meets with the mayor and some civilian leaders, black and white, to discuss how calm might be restored. He says that the riots were not caused by a spontaneous uprising, but by a vicious criminal element. The snipers who anonymously talked to Life magazine said that killing wasn't the main goal, but while police dealt with them, they wanted to be a distraction so local folks could grab supplies and appliances they desperately wanted and needed. Five or six shots, according to one sniper, was enough to draw cops while giving the others time to escape. The mayor felt differently. The situation had worsened tonight, he says by Saturday, and the blame is with an organization of people who hate America. Both Hughes and Adonis, you know, you know, after the riots are going to convene various forums and learn a little bit more than they had prior to the riots about the causes. Uh, I've come to the conclusion that there probably is uh, some element of our community out there that evidently we haven't been reaching. Uh, we thought that we had a continuing dialogue with our community, with all elements of our community. But evidently, this is not so. Late on Sunday night, Governor Hughes, other government officers meet with community activists. They tell the authorities the presence of state police and National Guard is doing more harm than good. They tell them about the incidents of police shooting up businesses that say Soul Brother or any other message of African-American solidarity. By mid-afternoon Monday, the governor orders state troopers and National Guardsmen out of Newark. There's still a group of citizens who say it's too early. Sign a petition of the mayor asking him to keep the troops patrolling the streets. It's not his decision to make. There are additional arrests of 70 people on Monday. But about six days from when events began, it begins to calm down. Yet... 12-year-old Michael Pug is shot while emptying a garbage pail on the sidewalk in front of his house. 
on 15th Avenue. The family said the bullet, which hit him in the gut, came from the direction of a group of National Guardsmen gathered one block away. A 24-year-old named William Furr talks to a Life magazine. We're not rioting against all of you whites. We're rioting against police brutality, like the cab driver they beat up. When the police treat us like people instead of treating us like animals, riots will stop. As he's talking to this magazine writer, he's taking loaded goods stolen from a liquor store into a car. Fur offers the reporter a beer. Take it. If the cops show up, get rid of it and run like hell. It's moments after that he speaks those words. Police arrive. Fur runs down the sidewalk, just like that, just like he said. And an officer in a yellow riot helmet fires his shotgun. The cover of that week's Life, they don't have a photo of Fur in Life magazine, but the cover of Life magazine would be a 12-year-old boy, Joe Bass, flat on his belly. What happens out of this? Well, New York's population drops. Uh, Each year after 67, real estate values will drop, unemployment will increase. There's a little bit of positive lately in New York development. President Johnson can means a commission called the Kerner Commission, 11 people on it, to study riots in various cities in 67 and 68 and to see what can be done about the problem. He doesn't really do much with the report. In fact, the first draft that comes out, he finds too condemning and asks them to send a second draft. Even that one says, our nation is moving towards two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. The suggestions made were investments in social services curtail de facto segregation, and retrain police forces, among other fixes. But there's a haunting paragraph in the Kerner Commission. In one portion, authors quote testimony by a psychologist, Kenneth B. Clark. He's, this is him writing in 67. I read the reports of the 1919 riot in Chicago as if I were reading the report of the investigating committee on the Harlem riot of 35 or the report of the investigating committee of the Harlem riot of 43 or the report of the McCone Commission on the Watts riot of 65, he said. I must again in candor say to you members of this commission, it is a kind of Alice in Wonderland with the same moving picture re-shown over and over again the same analysis, the same recommendations, the same inaction. And as I search for something to say, having spoken at length about the history now of this one Newark riot that got a lot of attention in 1967, it certainly is a Newark story and a New Jersey story, but really was just one of hundreds of riots in 1967 and called rebellion by many of the people involved in it, which I'll get to in a second. But the first thing I want to say is that I was struggling of what to say, seeing the image of George Floyd. And I think like all TV viewers, you're, you're, there's a certain helplessness to watching anything on TV or on a uh, video on social media and the like. That's horrible. And you struggle because just like Kenneth B. Clark is saying in his time, trying to gain some perspective from historical events and finding nothing But this continuation, I find the same thing. You know, what can history add? I mean, we must perform historical analysis. And many times it's very useful to help us to say that things have occurred before. Um, What it can't always do is say that things will get better. But we hope it will. I certainly hope it will. There's a lot in this story. I think... From my own perspective, one of the things that's at first jarring when you delve into the research and you're trying to look at things really from that overused phrase, both sides, like the, the, or the many sides, the, the city of Newark, 
the police, the state, the sort of um, established African-American community, and those who were rioting. The first jarring thing is to see like that difference between it being called a rebellion and it being called a riot. And a riot is something that's disorder and must be put down, right? And, and, and a rebellion speaks to broader changes. And it's at first drawing, but I do understand to an extent, because what may appear like a riot on the surface, um, for people that have, you know, from their perspective, have absolutely no hope that things are going to get better, you know, let's just put it this way, their logic becomes different. And for instance, I think the dominant narrative of the Newark riots, you're about to see, I think, uh, the Sopranos prequel will be coming out, The Saints of Newark. And I know just from looking at some of the filming uh, news coverage of it, that they're going to cover the riots and they had tanks and things. They brought tanks back to the streets of Newark to look at that and but the dominant narrative of that uh, Newark riot, even even the the way it was touched on in The Sopranos in the past, is that the Newark riots happened and then people who were white left the city and moved to the suburbs. And that certainly is a documented fact. And it's also assumed that the city kind of fell into chaos, corruption, unemployment, violence, drugs, and the, and the like. And some of that is also documented fact. It's not universally true, though, to say that things were worse because for someone that lived there in 1961 or 1962, those African-American, well, you'd have to ask them and, and, and find out because for them, maybe having self-government was better. And so if we only look at history kind of as one kind of rolling linear view um, this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and we, we lose some of the multiple perspectives. And I think that was useful in doing this, and then looking at the events of today, where you see similar things going on, right? There's talk about, there's there's certainly looting going on, there's talking of, talk about uh, justifying looting, there's, talking of, there's talk about, uh, for some, I'm sure, the looting alone disqualifies any grievance that the person may have had and that was the position at least initially of the mayor of newark and the governor of new jersey in 1967 though in reality they did come around and many people in newark came around ken kenneth gibson when he becomes mayor in 1970 is going to receive enough support from white voters that he's able to get elected enough of them came around and said this is what the city needs to do but yet you can't get around the fact that it's these actions consisted of people burning down buildings, doing sniping, even if the amount of sniping was exaggerated, shooting police, a, a, a small group, breaking windows, causing property damage, causing even black merchants to go out of business or white merchants that had serviced their community to go out of business. Here's what Thomas Sal said about... Um, the Detroit riots, which happened a few weeks later. It was not despair that fueled the riot. It was the riot which marked the beginning of the decline of Detroit to its current state despair. You know, I respect Thomas Sowell. He's a very considered, and I think people should go to him often to get, you know, at least another viewpoint on things. So that's definitely a viewpoint, and that's probably the dominant story uh, of Newark. You know, you had these riots, and then the city declined. And so for a group of people, that's going to be how they view the news today. For another group, it may be what people said at the time, what um, the father of the current mayor of Newark said, that uh, you know the looting was caused by the fact that you sold these people a bull of goods and then gave them no opportunity of getting it. You know, you hear those justifications today. And while I personally believe that no one should be breaking any windows, stealing anything that's not theirs, that doesn't mean I can't also look at their point of view. And that's how we see today. So that's how they, these events, these politics are going to turn on, right? And that's exactly what happened because 
1967 and 1968. Um, in some local areas, you got changes in government. You got Cleveland, Detroit, Newark, New Jersey are going to get African American mayors. But in the national politics, Lyndon Johnson's great society is going to give way to Nixonism. It really is. You see that Humphrey makes his vice presidential choice and he chooses Muskie, uh, Edmund Muskie, who is senator from Maine, very well respected, kind of has a soft voice that's very gentle in these times, really calms down the 68 convention. I'm going to put a plug in now. You know, subscribe to the extra podcast where my history could beat up your politics. Subscribe to the premium cast. It could be as little as $2 a month. We're going to go over all the events of 1968, including Lyndon Johnson's decision to withdraw and whether that decision was real or just part of a secret plot on the part of LBJ to actually get drafted at the convention. We're going to, we're going to uncover all of those things. But put that aside, Humphrey chooses Muskie. Lyndon Johnson, by the way, can't stand Muskie. And I think to some degree, this is Hubert Humphrey's one little thing that he gets to pick. And of course, he's going to stick at the Johnson a little bit and not pick uh, Terry Sanford or one of the Southern governors who Johnson would have loved for him to pick as his vice presidential candidate. Nixon chooses Spiro Agnew. Nobody knows who Spiro Agnew is. But in Maryland, he had been governor just a short time. And there's a riot in Baltimore after Martin Luther King's assassination. And Agnew had been known as a moderate. He calls in clergymen and other African-American leaders in the state. And then he lambasts them. I mean, he goes through all the reasons why they're not doing the right thing and they should be doing more. Blaming them for the riots. Some of them get up and walk out. We didn't come here for this. Doesn't matter. Agnew's got a new audience now. He wants to be the candidate, the governor of law and order. It gets him the nomination. Nixon picks him. First of all, he doesn't want competition. Um, He's going to be a little wrong on that. Agnew actually will end up being a little bit of that. But he also wants to pick a border state governor. So Maryland Works helps to bring in Virginia for Nixon in 68. Nixon wins that election. And he gets to determine the national agenda for some time. So you can go into your personal feelings about things, your ideologies. You can look at the politics and how... The events of today might determine things, but that's how the views were in 68. And you're seeing remarkable closeness to 2020. What else? Um, And what are we a little better at today? Maybe tiny bit better at coverage, news coverage. I mean, news coverage of those Newark riots were so biased that The New York Times and Time Magazine later, you know, all but apologized for how they covered it and the language that they used, you know, that uh, the agency that would describe things like, you know, cops and firemen killed by snipers, but everybody else that was killed was just killed in the riots. Or as they describe one young man killed by a shotgun blast. Wow. Didn't know that a shotgun had a mind of its own. So, you know, are we a little better today on on that front? Maybe. Um, Will we get out of this? Will we assess opportunities? Um, Do we need further civilian police commissions? You're hearing radical talk, I would call it, of abolishing police departments. Well, you know, that's, I think, where that is. That should be left at that end of the spectrum, if you ask me. Um, It's not up to me, but... um, you know, I think just one look at stats at things like, say, domestic violence, um, and you'll see how busy police are during the day. Do you look at something like civilian re- review? Do you change the rules, um, the operating procedure? Do you change how they're governed? All those things, I think, are up on the table now. And they were to an extent in 67. Because if you look at Newark, New Jersey in 67. This is not, I'm pulling out one state that happens to be one I'm familiar with, but there are multiple examples. There's going to be incidents in Detroit, in DC. The next year is going to have a huge ride, you know, not too long, not too far from the White House. Um, But if you look at Newark, New Jersey, you're seeing that it's, it's almost in a similar state because the politics could not be ignored by the people in government in that city. 
because the politics in that city, if not the state at that time, were changing. And they had to listen. Today on McCarter Highway in Newark, it beams blues and greens, banana yellow peels, gold and purple in a color mural. A 100-year-old Amtrak retention wall below the tracks runs the mural portraits, the city's official mural, that stretches for 25 football fields. It is the second largest mural in the nation. Various artists painted these murals, some of them from Newark, some of them used to be from Newark, some are from surrounding communities. On one spot, there are pictures of parents and baby. Part of my family used to live in Newark, and I started coming to visit them, the artist said, when I was around 15. They were my introduction to Newark before I moved to New Jersey. And on this mural, there's a photo of a young boy playing with an egg beater in a puddle. You never see a kid playing with an egg beater anymore, the artist says. No less playing with an egg beater in a puddle. I caught his reflection in the puddle, and it became my first signature image. He's in college now, and he's six feet tall and 200 pounds. When I took that picture, he was maybe 60. I took the photographs when I got out of school, and the reason I took them was because the housing project was going to be torn down. I wanted to be sure it was documented. There's a common misperception about people in the projects that they're in bad circumstances. These people had good jobs and went to school and had good lives. It wasn't like a rat-infested drug slum. The good thing is that the housing project has a Facebook page. They have reunions every year, and I'm connected to the kids I photograph. I reach out to them. Adrian Wheeler's panel is a black background with white dresses repeated over and over again. If you're walking behind the mural on Railroad Avenue, there are two streets there. My paternal grandparents were born on those streets, and they later married in Newark in 1887. The dress you see on the mural is from my mother's grammar school graduation in 1942. It's a little Swiss dot dress she made in sewing class in preparation for graduating from Morton Street Elementary in Newark. For Kevin Darmain, he had been researching Nubian quilts, I knew that Newark is connected to the rest of the world because it's a transportation hub. We were working on a train line, so that made me think of the Underground Railroad, how quilts were used to sort of communicate with runaway slaves. If they saw a quilt hanging at someone's house, there was some symbolism that let them know whether it was safe to stay there or not. So the train line became like a metaphor for me. For Jaren Work, the artist, their panel was called Portal Flow. But it has an icon that will first strike you as the Statue of Liberty. But actually, it's Newark's Lady Liberty. She represents the earth, the spirit of flight and its creatures, like the cranes in the Passaic River. The port of Newark on the right represents the male, the mind, and the industries that shape the city. The male and female meet, and magic follows. The waters move, the cranes fly, and the energy is alive in all the fish and ships carrying their goods. Recently in Newark, exactly where the 1967 rebellion began, near the same precinct building, a community group of Newarkers noticed that there were strangers coming to town. And, and they were talking about burning the city down uh, in response to George Floyd's killing and other recent events. According to Cesar Adams, interviewed in a local Newark newspaper, he said that they confirmed the people to be outsiders that were discussing burning the city down. That's when I got really involved and let them know they were going to start a riot, that people like myself and others who live here have parents and grandparents who lived through those 67 riots, and we've come a long way for us to go back down that same road again. One individual wound up jumping on a police car and attempted to smash a window when I grabbed him off. These agitators, some of which wore red cloths over their face during the day, provided different accounts of where they were from, other New Jersey towns to out-of-state locations like Colorado or Brooklyn. Said one of the members of the community group, it was just unreal to see these agent provocateurs come to our city with the intention to cause chaos. We're skeptical of any protests that are happening because while we're outraged about our brother George Floyd being killed by police, we don't want to burn down our city. These locals described... 
the aspiring arsonists as young white anarchists from their appearance and behavior. That's from a local. I didn't see a lot of news coverage about it. Certainly we're seeing a level of unrest that it's hard to find, you know, recent comparisons to. Um, one of the things I'm talking about on the premium podcast is the Whiskey Rebellion. And I'm not going to belittle the events of today to try to compare to anything. Anytime you're comparing events of today to something that happened with the guys with the trifold hats, you know, it could be seen as belittling. I don't think for historians it is because we see such commonality in events, even if they happened 200 years ago. But um, that's on the premium podcast. You can subscribe to that, www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Go there. Because I'm going to talk in more detail about the Whiskey Rebellion and something that my last guest, Lindsay Chervinsky, talked about, which was the cabinet. And it's the how Washington used the advice from his cabinet to come up with a solution for the people who were revolting in western Pennsylvania. But also, one of the things her book talks about, and then also other books on the Whiskey Rebellion in Pittsburgh talk about, is how that... There were more um, latent causes than just the whiskey excise tax that Hamilton wanted to put through and that many of the rebels make it clear. There's even a guy who rides through Pittsburgh on a horse with a tomahawk while there's a meeting outside the city really scaring them that rebels are going to invade and says, you know, I'm not just here about an excise tax. I want your judges, your associate judges. You know, I want a lot more. This is just the beginning. And he's screaming his head off, letting people know. This scares Pittsburgh. And they actually take some actions, including things that we kind of see with local police and mayors today. And in, in, in they, they try to, um, you know, reach out to the protesters at, of their time, to the rebels. Um, they even have a citizen's parade that's showing, you know, common cause with them. We're not the federal government. We're the leadership of Pittsburgh, you know, and the city is largely spared. So I get into that more in the premium podcast, so listen to that. And what about John Smith, whose taxi cab ride... And beating started the riots. A year after, John Smith came to Salisbury, North Carolina, which was his home for good. Although he was still waiting for appeals on a prison sentence he had received because he was charged with assaulting the police officers. It took five years from the time of the riots and four years after his convic- conviction before a three-judge panel of the U.S. Third District Court of Appeals decided in his favor. They ruled his indictment for assault and battery on the officer should never have happened because in a city where African Americans were one half of the population, none were on his grand jury. His parents... Matthew and Mary Emma Smith in Salisbury, North Carolina had no idea their son had been involved in these events until they saw him on the front cover of Time. He never renewed his cab driver's license. He worked construction jobs. And passed in 2002. Every few years from 67 to that year, he would be contacted by various media outlets as different anniversaries of the riots came. He would be part of history. But it's not what he wanted. All he really wanted to do was play the trumpet. Well, thank you for listening. Stay safe. Uh, reach out. You know, I'm at Twitter, 
at my HIST, at my HIST. Would love to hear from you. Also, we have a fans of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics on Facebook. So join there. Go to the website at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Thanks for listening.